Good morning. This will be the service for December the 19th, the last Sunday before Christmas. Uh, shout out, please. First to Carolyn Kruger, such a wonderful longtime member and supporter of the church. Carolyn will turn 90 very soon. She's been keeping her strength up and trying to get out more, but having to be very careful. We have a new wave of coronavirus, and yesterday we had something like 25,000 new cases around the state. It's nothing to mess with. I hope you will take it very seriously. It kills people who are perfectly healthy, had no fear of it, and most, most of the people who die from it are the unvaccinated, according to the facts. And certainly there are vaccinated people who still get it, but much less in its intensity. Um, don't mess with it. When God provides us a way to protect ourselves, or at least to try to protect ourselves, we ought to take it. That's just wisdom. But Carolyn has been staying in. I also want to ask you to keep praying for Janet Evans, George Denoyan, for whom we have been praying for so long, did die in hospice. And pray that Janet will not be overcome with her grief. There is uh, the line, there is the story of Jacob in the Old Testament. And when Jacob's beloved wife died, the scripture says, he could not be consoled. He was inconsolable, which is why we have that word. It expresses a state of grief that crushes the person. Now, Janet is herself in her 80s, a wonderful lady. But pray for Janet to have <clears throat> the strength to recover and not to grieve the loss of George so terrible that it crushes her life. Ask for that mercy for Janet as you would want it for yourself. We've got uh, Thanksgiving behind us and now Christmas and Janet has had to have those two events or will have this, the second event very soon without her beloved George. <clears throat> also want to give a shout out to our medical personnel Claudine Sordle and, and um, Angie and um, Sue West, Sue Work, and so many people who are involved in this. Karen Isles keeps me apprised every week of what's going on in, in uh, St. Mary's Hospital. Her ward is completely filled with COVID patients. So what we didn't want to have happen, the Lord has let happen, and the Lord can stop, stop it when he's ready. And we just pray that he'll have mercy on us and stop it. So shout out to Claudine and all of those who labor in the health sciences as nurses and doctors and the rest. Also shout out to Paul Anderson and Rita Barrios. They are a faithful couple whom I haven't seen in a while, but they always uh, support the church and everything. I just miss them. Would love to see them again. And for uh Manny and Astrid Valdivieso, whom I don't expect to see much because they moved up north, I think to Traverse City. But I miss them. I miss those faces. Uh, the, one of the glories of a smaller church is that everybody knows everybody. And we pray for each other by name. You can't do that when you've got 5,000 people in the sanctuary. It's very, very difficult. But a smaller congregation, you can do it. And that's a blessing from God to have that kind of bonds uh, among members and visitors whom we consider our own. So pray for those and let's pray for them now. Our Father, we know that the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings too deep to be uttered. And we know that your Son, the Lord Jesus, prays at your right hand for us, makes intercession for us. For these prayers, we know will be answered. And you love us, Lord. You are for us and not against us. So we ask for all these that we have mentioned, that you give them the greatest joy they ever thought possible, even in the midst of those who are grieving. That we may live by faith, not by sight. And we may know that as our outward man dies, our inward man is renewed from faith to faith. God, be merciful to us. Please.
For Jesus' sake, amen. In our worship service today, our gathering song will be that great classic, Away in a Manger. You probably learned it as a child. And there's several tunes, but it, it, in any regard, it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful Christmas hymn. Then we'll have our call to worship from Psalm 98, 6 through 9. And that will be um, responsive, of course. And then we'll sing Joy to the World, a hymn that requires a good lung full of air. And then we'll have the invocation in the Lord's Prayer, the lighting of the fourth Advent candle. We count down Advent by the lighting of the candles each week. We add a new candle every week until Christmas Eve. And we have congregational members who will come and read and uh, lead us in that part of the lighting of the candle in the prayer. Then we have the first scripture readings from Micah 2 uh, and 2 through 5a. Then we have Luke 1, 46 through 55. Then we'll sing the glory of pottery. These are all elements of common worship for, for the last hundreds of years among Christian churches. Then we will sing another great hymn, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. And then the doxology as we praise God for giving us something to give. Then the second scripture readings, Hebrews 10, 5 through 10, and Luke 2, 8 through 20. And today my, my emphasis is on Luke 2, 8 through 20, which is the story of the angels appearing to the shepherds. And the key text is verse 16. It says this in Luke 2, 16. So the shepherds went with haste. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. The shepherds hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. We have to ask ourselves the question, why should there be a miraculous announcement at all? Why make it to the shepherds? Now, I don't intend to expand this point at the moment, but the shepherds in Bethlehem were most likely the keepers of the sheep that will be sacrificed in the temple. They were a special group, but they were a very important group. And what a way to make the announcement to come to the shepherds who kept the lambs that were sacrificed to make the announcement about the Lamb of God. Now, that language was not used by the, by the angels when they came. But why should there be a miraculous announcement at all to these shepherds? It was such a small group of people in an obscure place. And their announcement appears to have been forgotten some 30 years later when Jesus began his public ministry. Luke, being a most excellent historian, surely heard this story of the angels appearing firsthand from some of the shepherds. They wouldn't likely be in their 50s, maybe early 60s, could have even been 40s if they were very young shepherds. So Luke heard these stories firsthand. Mary surely heard the stories when they came into the stable where the babe was lying. These men she had never met, she didn't know they were coming, and they related these stories. It was told with such detail that it had to have come from an eyewitness. So why was this angelic announcement given? The announcement was made and recorded, and the song of the angels was sung because it helped the world then and now to understand the nature and meaning of that event. The shepherds ran with the meaning of this song on their hearts. The deliverance of this message and the privilege it provided to these humble men symbolizes the destination of the gospel for all men of all times and all classes. Here's what the angel said, For unto you is born this day. The message was for them. Yes, and more than just them. And it is for all the people, the angel said, but particularly to you now. Until you grasp that the Christ was born for you. It's just another tale. 
It may be true, but it has no bearing whatever on my life until I grasp that unto you and to the whole world and to all people this miracle has come, the birth of the Son of God. So what did they run to see? We know why it was given to them now, because it encourages them and encourages the world to receive the Christ. And what did they run to see? They ran to see, first of all, what God had given them. The angel says, unto you is born this day. Faith first requires that you accept the facts of the story. There appears to be no hesitation in these men to go see for themselves. What if the story said, the angels told them what is taking place there in Bethlehem, where they were just on the outskirts, in a stable that they surely were familiar with, being shepherds of these animals. And they had simply said, oh, yawn, okay, well, let's take a nap. I don't feel like being in a hurry this morning, and uh, maybe tomorrow I'll go see, perhaps. No, there was no casual strolling by these men. As soon as the angels disappeared, they ran to see what God had given to them. This is the confirmation of the facts. God was pleased to confirm the truth with a sign. You shall find the babe wrapped in cloth, strips of cloth, and lying in a feeding trough. The facts surrounding Jesus were verified by real history. This is the incarnation. This is God coming in the flesh, as helpless as any human being gets when they are first born. And the shepherds were eyewitnesses. There was a book some years back, May in May, published in May of 2003, The Secret Gospel of Thomas. It is a book written for skeptics of the Christian faith. The premise of the book is that the writers of the four Gospels recorded the wrong facts about Jesus. And ever since they did, Christianity has been on the path of a fool, believing and teaching what simply isn't true. Rather, this book says, there is a document called the Gospel of Thomas, and yes, there is which the early church erroneously discarded, the book says, and which tells the real meaning of the life of Jesus. Now, just to show you the motivation of the book written in 2003, there was a follow-up in 2013. And the follow-up was published with this title, Beyond Belief, Agnostic Musings for 12-Step Life agnostic musings for 12-step life. And then the subtitle says, finally, a daily, reflect, daily reflection book for non-believers, free thinkers, and everyone. Folks, the early church did not make a mistake in listening to what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had to say about Jesus. And they didn't make a mistake about rejecting the false gospel of Thomas. The eyewitnesses all agreed on the facts of the good news about Jesus, all of them. The angelic visits to Zechariah were confirmed, to Mary, the angels speaking to Mary, the angels to Joseph, to the shepherds. They were all alive together at the same time and confirmed the facts. The miracle of the virgin birth, the miracle of the star that led the wise men to Bethlehem, the miracles performed by Jesus in proof of being the Son of God. His resurrection from the dead. As Paul writes, he was seen by above 500 people at one sitting and appeared to all the apostles, to many people over a period of 40 days and 40 nights. His ascension into heaven was witnessed. These are the historical facts established in the gospel, in the same way that all facts are established today by many credible witnesses. Faith requires that you look at the facts and believe that they are true. 
Never does, never does God ask you to ignore the facts and believe what is only fanciful or wishful thinking. So God grounds the gospel in verifiable facts established by credible eyewitnesses. If you're tempted to disbelieve your Bible, ask yourself, why have so many of the most brilliant minds of anyone who's ever lived embraced it? What is it about the Bible? that makes it so powerful. First of all, it is the word of God, but it is it is brought to bear in history. Real people, real actions, real crucifixion, real prophets, real, all of it established by eyewitnesses. The shepherds ran then, first of all, to see what God had given them, a savior in a feeding trough in Bethlehem. Second of all, they ran to experience what God had given them, not just to see it, but to make it their own. Faith, then, requires that you act on the message of the story and make it your own. Anytime you hear the gospel, it's now your responsibility to make it your own. Faith requires that, that we make it our own. The announcement of the angels was more than an opportunity to witness an unusual event. That the shepherds might receive their Lord and have faith in God's provision for sinners was the reason for the announcement. Some years ago, when we lived in Jackson, Mississippi, our children were little, there was a great explosion of a gas pipeline, which exploded about a mile from our home, but... Uh, airplanes who were in Dallas, Texas, circling the airport 450 miles away, saw the explosion. That's how big it was. We were jolted by a huge sound of rushing wind like a tornado or a jet on top of the house. It was thunderous. Thinking it was a tornado, we grabbed the boys and huddled into the bathtub. But as the sound remained constant, after a while, we slowly emerged from the house to see the entire night sky lit up like the day. We climbed into the car to drive a very short distance to see this great thing which had come to pass. Now, we, we drove down to the waterfront. We lived on a huge uh, reservoir. But we the, the, the explosion occurred north of us, so we looked straight across the great large bay. There was no obstruction and it was on the edge of the shore on the other side. We climbed into the car to go see it, and we stood in the night and gawked at the sight, but after about an hour, we turned our faces around and went home. There was nothing else to see. It was just this gigantic flame. You could feel the heat a mile away. It was really something to see. It was spectacular, but after that, it had no meaning. So we went home and went back to bed. We determined the facts, we were thrilled by the facts, but we were unchanged by the facts. These shepherds ran to experience what God had given them and told them, and they made this child their own. God sent us the Christ, his only son, in order to save us from our sins. But we must receive his lordship over us through repentance from sin and faith in the person and the work of Christ alone. The shepherds ran to confirm their faith. They took the whole thing very personal. We must take it personal also. So the second reason the shepherds ran was to experience what God had given them. The first reason was to see what God had given them, but it had to move beyond sight to where they embraced in their hearts the truth when they saw this child. And then there is a third reason why the shepherds ran. They ran to tell others what God had done. After they ran to the, uh, to the manger, then they hurried home, the scripture says. When they had seen him, here's what verses 17 and 20 say in Luke. When they had seen him, 
they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Those are the words of Luke. Faith, lastly, requires that you and I tell others the good news. We see Christ, we embrace Christ, and then we tell others of the truth of Christ. There are many ways to tell others. You don't have to be a television evangelist, and you don't have to be an ordained pastor. You don't even have to have the gift of evangelism. You just need to live your faith. And if anyone asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you, you tell them Christ died for sinners. At just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You tell them that. That is bearing witness to the Christ that you have seen and embraced. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, True faith always talks about what it believes. And the shepherds believed and spread the word about Jesus. Don't know if you remember, if you were ever married, when you got engaged. But I've always noticed when couples get engaged, they want to tell everyone about the one they love. The girl wants to show her ring. Finally, he gave me a ring. The boy wants to talk about his beautiful bride. That's just the way they are because they're in love. And they're not ashamed of that love. They want to talk about it. Faith in Jesus is the same way. The shepherds ran to tell others what God had done for them. That's what our testimony is. What God has done for us. Pardon me of all my iniquities. Cleanse me from all my sin. So in conclusion, why did the shepherds run? They ran to see what God had given them. A savior. A babe. Hours old. Wrapped in cloths. Lying in a manger. His mother Mary there also. Lying in the hay. Joseph there too. This was highly unusual. They would not forget it for sure. They ran to see what God had given them. Then, second of all, they ran to experience what God had given them. Seeing is not enough. You have to embrace it. Embrace the gospel. Embrace Jesus as your Savior. Say to him, I know that you died for sinners. You died for me. And you rose again from the dead for me. And you will come again someday for me. Thank you, Lord. And then they ran to tell others what God had done for all the people, not just for them. You too, be aware that there are many opportunities and many ways to bear witness to the grace of God in your life. That's all you're bearing witness to, the grace of God. Christ died for the ungodly. I've used that phrase many times when people talk about faith or talk with me about religion. I say Christ died for the ungodly and I qualify. And that's why I love him. So I hope that you will have a good Christmas this next 24th coming right up. Uh, the Christmas Eve will have a service and then the next day, of course, is Christmas Day. I hope if you're in town, you can come to our candlelight Communion service, 4 o'clock on December the 24th. It's still daylight. You'll have time to get out and you won't have to drive home in the dark. So come celebrate with us. Let us pray. Lord, be merciful to your children. Call us to yourself. Grant us the Holy Spirit that we may believe, even as did these shepherds. And now may the grace of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit, Rest with all of you who love him in sincerity. For Christ's sake, amen. Go in the peace of the Lord.